Welcome to Discover Film. On today's podcast, we're talking to James Seward. James made a short film called The Past Inside the Present, and it's the kind of film you just have to see. It reminds you of great filmmakers like Terry Gilliam and Stanley Kubrick. You can just tell he had this crystal clear vision and that he accomplished that vision. We're about to talk to James, but if you want to get the most out of the conversation, you should go to discoverfilm.net and watch The Past Inside the Present. I'm telling you, it's going to blow your mind. You're going to want to know why I'm praising it so much. All right, let's talk to James. And even uh, the guy that runs the projection booth, uh, or well, the tech guy at the theater, he told me at the second season of Film Invasion, he's like, remember that one uh, past inside the present? I said, yeah. He goes, he's like, I show that to people at home. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. Well, if only every film festival felt the way that you do. Well, before before we talk about the past inside the present, let me ask you what uh, what got you to the point that you were able to make a film that combines live action and animation. Obviously, seems like a a labor of love, something that took you a long time to make. Yeah, definitely. Um, it was. It was a really. It took a really long time. It took like about two and a half years. I mean, you know, I wasn't working entirely on the film that whole time, but uh, but yeah, for about a year and a half, for sure, that was like, I spent, you know, a good 70 hours a week on it. So um, I think it was more like I thought, I mean, it was my thesis project uh, for my college, and it was more along the lines of I felt like, this was my last chance to do something uh, that was so kind of labor intensive and, and weird. And that it was the last time chance that society really get in college gives you a free pass to do something uh, basically self-absorbed with no real monetary value. Right. You, you were doing it. Was it for undergrad or graduate film school? Uh, it was for undergrad, but it yeah, it took me. I I I didn't finish it for another another year and a half, really. So I graduated in uh, May or yeah, June of 2014, and I finished the film in January of 2016. Yeah, so you stay you stayed at it long after school. Yeah, which is, you know, I mean, again, that's something that I think that a, a lot of people don't have that charity to, to work full time on a short film project for a year of their lives, you know. Yeah, but uh, also, so I, they, probably, they probably don't have an idea that's so worthy of it. I don't know. I feel like what comes first, the chicken or the egg. I think most people probably don't consider doing things because they it's outside of their means, you know? Yeah, it could be. Could be. Well, so tell me, what is your story before or what led you into film school? Um, and I assume, did you also study some animation, too? Um, I don't really have any formal animation training. Really? Um, I mean, yeah, it was. It, it, I mean, the film is rotoscoped, which is in a way a much. I mean, real animators will tell you that that's it's kind of a cheat because uh, you're really just tracing. And then the 3D animation uh, that was kind of the foundation of the visual effects. I'm I, you know, there's a lot of online information, a lot of tutorials. So you, I was more just like you get a picture in your head and then kind of search for the tutorials that uh, allowed you to, to kind of figure it out. Yeah, but you're downplaying it, but you, so you had a vision and then you worked out how to get it to screen. Yeah. And I mean, the whole idea of the rotoscoping, it's funny. This is like a first time I've talked about this movie and, you know, since I it really, I haven't talked about it since I went to fe the festivals, which is mostly last year. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so the story behind it is that uh, I felt like I couldn't really... The original idea was it was not meant to be rotoscoped, or at least that wasn't the original idea. The original idea was that it was going to be photorealistic and, and all these things were really going to 
look as if they totally existed. And I just didn't have the, I knew I didn't have the visual effects skills to pull that off. So instead of, instead of trying to do something and doing it, doing a poor job of something I thought I wanted to change the intention, uh, and make, and, and use a technique that, I uh, I thought heightened the sense of, uh, time passing and the, you know, material degrading and all these things. So I felt like it thematically built on what was already there in the, uh, I don't know, not narrative, but scenario, but uh, also allowed it to be uh, not apologizing for itself. Right. Uh, but but you, you wrote, know, so you wrote the, did you write the whole thing out as a screenplay or did you storyboard it or both? Uh, I think when I first kind of started doing it, I, I tried to write something um, in 2009, uh, but I... At that point, I had I was just uh, it had a lot of sort of vestigial parts that got lost as I found the core of what was important to me. And then by the time I was really thinking about doing it again, um, in I think yeah, late 2012, I want to say it was all visual. I just yeah, so I storyboarded it and we. Uh, shot it in in september of 2013 and i'd storyboarded it over that summer right so so that's so you storyboarded and shot and then you actually dealt with the animation really the goals of of your visual concepts yeah um and uh, yeah and that post-production process of like really being in it was like 18 months right but even even going back a little further I mean, I kind of want to delve into you chose, you know, videotape. I assume you chose the idea of featuring videotape as the technology that's dominating these people and distorting their reality. I mean, you obviously live in the era of the smartphone and the touchscreen, but I assume that is it was a conscious choice to go back, you know, a couple of generations of technology in what you feature in the film. Definitely. I mean, I think that a, I think for one, the past is always aesthetic, you know, like, uh, we are, it's like, I, we watch old movies and in a way you enjoy them like you enjoy period movies today. And you notice the way things look because the way things are right now seems so you're surrounded by it. It's unremarkable. And so you don't really and you just kind of take for granted the aesthetic of whatever the current area is in. So I think that just in terms of a, of a thing that I was visually interested in, I was interested in the way Betamax tapes looked. I was interested in, uh, the way VHS tapes looked. And then on a, so on a, and then on a thematic level, I mean, the film is really about the degradation of memory and the, uh, and the, how uh, time eats away at our identity and digital technology. I mean, I guess this is maybe a simplification, but if uh, if you copy one file from a computer to another computer, if it's either there or it's not. Either you corrupted it because you know, one thing got wrong or whatever, or you have an exact perfect duplicate of the data. Whereas analog technology uh, was more of an analog to memory in the sense that, uh, by copying it, you have this sort of generational loss. Uh, and so there's the same feeling that by remembering something, uh, you, in your mind, encode these very particular salient features of the thing and uh, dismiss whatever is uh, irrelevant or whatever whatever hap- feels superfluous or doesn't capture the the emotion with which you are uh, conjuring the past. So I think that that was so I was I was just interested in it aesthetically, and but it also 
thematically fit the film better than than digital technology, which I feel like is just either there or not there, and one or zero, you know. But certainly that machinery is more visual than anything digital can be. Maybe. I mean, again, I think if you look back at this era in 20 or 30 years, if we even can look back at it, because we still have a civilization, um, we will see... People, people will be able to. It will see as the aesthetic of the present as something interesting and particular, and something that has a voice. But it's kind of just what we're surrounded by now, so it's hard to really talk about it as something that editorializes off of anything. But the original idea was honestly just this image of the bisected heads with with uh, these sort of circuit boards on top of them. And I don't know if if all the sort of um, whatever if the themes of the film were even there. I mean, that was in high school, and I just sort of drew these heads, and I didn't really have a thing to do with them. So they, it kind of came. It did definitely come out of the uh, iconography of sort of late seventies, eighties televisual technology. Right, but that's that's. I think that shows that you started with a visual. Yeah, definitely. It definitely I started with a visual. So even in high school you were were you so were you into film or shooting video and editing and doing things like that even in high school? Yeah. Uh yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been interested in making films since I was uh, you know, 11 or 12. Do you have any any story about that? Do you have something that inspired you or, or was it just always there? Yeah, I do actually. So, I mean, I think that when I was, a, you know, this is the story I always tell again, you sort of, these, uh, narratives get grandfathered in. Uh, but when I was like a li- really little kid, you just watch movies and you just think of them as like whatever stories that someone's telling, or it's just another way of conveying narrative. Um, so I didn't really think much of them at all. And then my dad took me to watch uh, this movie, Man with a Movie Camera, which was, it's like a 1929 uh, Soviet propaganda film, uh, which is, I guess, the reductive way of describing it. But what it's really about is sort of fulfilling the, or fulfilling what the director and the editor believe are the desire, innate desires of the camera for uh, autonomous ex- uh, exploration and uh, kind of, um, you know, like that the, that the camera has its desire to have this perceptual adventure throughout the world and um, and just letting it happen, you know? So, like, letting... Uh, letting the camera roam three throughout this kind of uh, early Soviet landscape and the uh, what was at that time kind of uh, latest machine technology, um, and so and uh, Vertov, the director, believed that you know we could emancipate our minds by by kind of giving free rein to the fecund perceptual desires of the camera itself. So it wasn't that, you know, what bound the story in time or what bound the kind of thing in time was just what does the camera want to see? Where does it want to go? What's it interested in? And to me, that opened up a whole different kind of movie, which was a movie uh, that was a perceptual adventure, you know, that where it was, it was about, um, moving through space and moving through perception. And so I think from that time on, I really looked at movies as, as, uh, uh, a way of fulfilling what I believe the camera is interested in seeing. And you Uh, saw that, did you say at around age 11 or 12? I was 11. Yeah. 11. So at age 11, you saw, a Soviet art film that completely changed your perception of the, the medium. 
Yeah, well, it was that, and and this is again, it's a kind of a story I always tell. But I also saw my, I also saw The Matrix around that same time, which was like a couple years old, but it was kind of in. It was like the first R-rated movie I saw, and and in that film, um, you know, there's a kind of a the famous part uh, where the you know whatever he uh, the uh, agent shoots. Keanu Reeves and the camera just spins around and again that really captured my imagination because I was like you can just literally stop the fucking story and the camera can just spin around the character because that's beautiful and interesting you know like all these yeah, things you can, that li- I think, you can literally change reality with the camera yeah and, you, and, and, and yeah and you can and the camera you know and people were very I think it's something that's gone out of fashion we don't talk about it very often but People were interested in that camera movement. That was, I mean, and 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 that m- movement became iconic and was like kind of omnipresent in action movies for the few years afterwards. To the point it became a cliche, because and I think that it was a recognition that uh, that there were that part of cinema is, is allowing the camera to to go on uh, a journey, a visually, intrinsically visually interesting journey through space and time. No, I was going to say, like, the thing that Vertov, Vertov articulated so well was, look, of course it's always people that are making these things, but when you feel inspired, it doesn't feel like it's you. It feels like these are the in, inherent desires of the material you're working with. You know, it's like... Uh, I think across all sorts of mediums, artists will dis- will have it dry- describe this experience where it's like, well, the you know, I the paint kind of guided me into it wanted to it wanted a stroke there or whatever the the kind of chord progression in itself started kind of making demands on you. So I think it's no different with cinema. It's like you just start feeling like you put down some some strokes and then there's sort of things that are called for, uh, that you just have to listen for. Yeah. Yeah. And the art speaks for itself. The art is communicating through the artist. Right. So, so that was, that's, I think that's the feeling, but I think Vertov had a way of articulating that, uh, that was, I don't know, to me felt, feels true. Yeah. No. So, so you had that experience as a young person and that's, but did you stay focused on film uh, right up through through college, or did you? Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I I I, I went to I would like I went to prep school, and there was a a kind of video production class there, and uh, and I made a movie that you know, again, it took me like two years to make this dumb little movie, but, uh, but I was very serious about it. Um, and, and then, yeah. And then I went to Bard and, uh, and was a film film major there. Uh, and I, yeah. And I, I try not to, to stop. It's hard to continue, but I, I've tried to, con- to continue to be a filmmaker. I do keep returning to animation and, and keep experimenting with it. Um, I don't think of my. I still don't think of myself as primarily an animator, but it is like. I just think you have to 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 be a filmmaker. To me, you and it, at some point you feel like you have to engage with the material, which is a series of pictures, and 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 so to engage with that is to engage with animation. You know, once you start considering film as a series of pictures, you're approaching the space of of being an animator in a way. Yeah, definitely. And and it obviously grants you freedoms that most filmmakers can't even access. This thing, it, it just gives you a greater palette, really, to work with. Yeah, I mean, I, it, but it's also, it's also, I think it's definitely like you couldn't, I think there's a mo- very few things could be told in this way. And I, and I always, I've wondered since if there's, if I want to make another film that kind of has uh, this same sort of like, I don't know, patina uh, or direct artifice uh, kind of built into the surface of it. And I, 
I'm not sure that I do, you know. Have you shot some films since this? I done well so I work uh you know sporadically as much as I can as a, uh as a cinematographer and as a visual effects artist um and so I've I've shot some other people's movies um and I've shot basically like one like two music videos since the completion and one music video I finished in February and the other one, which I shot like a year ago, I'm still working on the credits, is going to come out hopefully really soon. Hopefully. And those are ones where you're working with the bands. Um, yeah, I mean, in both cases, it's like the 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 film, though it you know went to some festivals and and this and that hasn't quite led to the whatever uh, success that you know, I dreamed, which was that people would ask me that like, I, maybe I would like get money to like make little music videos. Uh, so I, I mean, these were things that I, that me, I, I was friends with the artist and, uh, we said, we want to make a video. Um, and we tried to figure out a way to do it together. Right. And your goal after making this film, do you have features in mind or are you really more focused on short form things like video and and shorts um yeah so i have a, i don't have the i do not have features plural uh, i have a script that i've been working on um uh and i'm i'm just i mean as maybe you can tell and and probably from watching the movie and i'm just not a word oriented person when it comes to movies it's uh it's very much hard for me to construct things uh verbally like i mean like i say you're saying with the with the film in the first place it was it was i i had tried to write it and then eventually when i really got serious about making it i just storyboarded but this is the the film i'm writing now uh is just more of a does have i mean it has completely visual parts but it has pretty straightforward dramatic parts as well when you see movies that are sort of Clearly, the director's more visual than they are. I mean, I just watch Valerian, and and that's a, and that's a movie where and that guy is like so clearly. It's like, dude, you shouldn't be like. Don't even make a movie with dialogue if this is what you want to do. You know what I mean? Like, you, I would rather see him make a movie that was like a documentary about crazy, weird, imaginary planets than like a movie with fucking Cara Delevingne and and Dane DeHaan. Sure. I would just rather see him. Anyway, so my point is, I, I don't want to do it. it. It's so easy to be the person that is like the, or the thing you would think if you watch the movie is like, oh, well, this is just this visual person. So I really am kind of protective of taking the time with the writing uh, to feel like it really would work dramatically. Yeah, well, I would hope that people who see the past inside the present, I would hope their reaction is, that they'd want to see more from you because so few filmmakers, especially of your age, are that have such a clear vision. I mean, besides calling you a visual filmmaker, you actually have a vision. Well, thank you, man. Um, I don't know. I think that it's, it, it is a, a crowded field and a lot of... Uh, well, I mean, it's super crowded and there's a lot of people who... Uh, who are lining themselves up to be the next person who could direct, you know, a romantic comedy, which is great, but somebody has to be the next, I don't want to necessarily say cutting edge, but you know, somebody has to give us more than, than just knowing where to put the camera when two people are having a, a conversation. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, I think those people exist, you know, I mean, I like, I was at, I didn't actually see it there, but I was at Slamdance, and our film pre premiered at Slamdance at the same time that uh, Swiss Army Men, or Swiss, I was it Swiss Army Man or Swiss Army, anyway, that yeah, was at Sundance was that Army year. Man, yeah. um, and I don't think that that film is, is perfect exactly, but like those guys are definitely visionaries. Um, to me, there's no question. I think that there are a lot of people, I mean, you know, again, it's like you can you can say, like I have my like, 
bone that I would pick, but like you know, like I feel like I I'm because I'm I love music videos. I'm a huge music video fan, and and like for instance, they've I mean they've done just like consistently, obviously uh, specific and good work. You know, like even if the songs are not that awesome, I was rewatching um, Daniel's video for Houdini, and it's like every it's like just as dense as it could possibly be and i also wonder is it like with our emphasis on features like like i think that those guys are doing probably doing their best work uh in the short form but features are the only thing that gets seriously kind of considered in the marketplace or even really esteemed art artistically and i think it gives a short shift to a lot of people that want to make very detailed uh, short films. Yeah, definitely. That That's a tough one. One of the greatest things about the festival circuit is you get to see shorts, you know, right. And then because going on YouTube or Vimeo and just, you know, you can't just search great short film. I mean, it's just, it's, uh, it's really hard to access this stuff. Right. And then the only things that can really break through are something that can be put together as part of an anthology or, or, you yeah, know, anthologies, or anthologies are making a strong comeback, I guess, especially because of black mirror. Right. Um, but then those are almost, it's like, so the thematic ties have to be so kind of strong that, you know, I, I think that, I mean, I don't know, you know, ideally we would start to do, and I think that sometimes there's a thing that's done, but it's, pretty rare where we start to do shorts ahead of features and and like but i don't know you know yeah i think that and i think that even in the festivals it's like you know i had somebody tell me and i think it's true i don't think they're being mean i think they're just being honest is uh uh you know what gets you a career is coming to uh a festival with a feature you made yourself the the kind of short films are so crowded and they're so anyway it feels like it's really very hard to you know now that that film is democratized to the extent it is it's really hard to get any kind of recognition for a short film which i don't know i just think is a shame because it it feels like a lot of times the quality of the filmmaking suffers in the feature because the resources are stretched much thinner for, for filmmakers that don't have them. It's like, I think that you really get very high quality features oftentimes from, from filmmakers without resources that could rival in production value and kind of, uh, specificity, something that's happening in the theater, but it's getting ignored in favor of, of features that I think just can't have the same level of care put into each part of them because of the, because of the the kind of time schedule and pressure you're under to shoot a feature for very very cheap. Yeah, so the the in, the truly independent filmmaker can make just a far far more accomplished short, but people are going to ignore that in favor of the person who stretched stretched the dollars thin for 85 minutes. Yeah. I mean, I think I think that that is probably the truth you know i think that um i don't know yeah well it certainly is look as somebody who's on a jury at a film festival i can tell you that the number of just truly fantastic shorts you know there's not a million of them but they're definitely better when you come down to the features that get submitted to a film festival a lot of them are just quite flawed and and yeah it it's it's both harder to to maintain quality for for ninety plus minutes, even if you have an unlimited budget, let alone well, definitely. For, for working I mean, in those, I think, in those constraints. Yeah. yeah, I think that also it's just a question of um, of you know there is the thing that I think a lot of people would say is a rejoinder to what I'm saying, which is also just it's literally harder to make a compelling ninety minute thing than a compelling. 15 minute thing or a compelling 10 minute thing because you do I think that a lot of really kind of talented filmmakers uh, and I struggle with this all the time in the world of uh, you know 
they have a really good kind of setup and concept. But when you get into the feature thing, you have to make something of that in the, I don't know if you want to call it the third act, but you have to, you have to pull those threads together in a way that are, is genuinely cathartic and satisfying. Whereas I think with the short film, it's, it's basically, it can be a sort of a tease, you know, yeah. and it is allowed to be a sort of a tease of like, isn't this an interesting world? Like, aren't you interested in it? Okay, goodbye. Whereas with the feature, you kind of have to, you have to finish the sentence in a way that feels really uh, dramatically satisfying and truthful. Um, and that is genuinely probably much harder. Oh, definitely. I mentioned the Daniels uh, because I feel like that they're, they're, they're people that have really managed to, you know, they have a, a, a certainly a very entertaining brand and, uh, but it doesn't feel and and uh, they're able and they're able to bring it consistently to a bunch of different genres of music. Uh, but it doesn't feel cheap. It feels like they've got a general enough thing that is is uh, that they can apply it to a lot of different genres of music, and yet uh, it's recognizable and and uh, kind of a legitimate art tourist statement every time. But, uh, and I think there's a lot of people like that. Uh, it's just there's a lot of people that aren't. I bet there are. And, and, and we're also in a, I am, I am one of the people who really misses the era when, when music, when there, when there were music video channels and, and truly beautiful music videos actually did stand out. Yeah. Yeah. It's a real, I mean, it's a, it's kind of a, a I mean, it's kind of the biggest. Or it's probably something that makes me the saddest because that's really what I want to be doing. You know, I I love music videos. I love um, to me there it, there's a, a particular kind of compressed synesthetic magic that comes from watching uh, a narrative that was designed to fit a piece of music like a glove. Uh, but it just doesn't have i don't know if it's how we're how we're consuming music these days or whatever it doesn't feel like it's as much of a career path as it used to be or at least it isn't for me no one's called me up <laughs> right well that's tough if only the coolest musicians around would see the past inside the present i think maybe just maybe yeah you know it's funny i'll just ask have you seen that the Kanye video I have for Power that uh, he oh, yeah, yeah, I can't yeah. even, name, I can't even name the artist who made it. It's just an incredible music right. video. Right. Well, and Kanye's standing still, and I guess he just basically said, "Make something amazing." And the this artist did, you know, he had well, a video that came too. out. Didn't that come out around the same time as that? Because you know, another person I think is interesting who just made a couple interesting movies is. And, and then has kind of disappeared a little bit because he had some movies didn't do so well, but is Tar Sam. Uh, and he made that movie, which again, like Immortals I'm sure, is like not a good movie in a million different ways. But what he was doing with that film or what he did with some of the kind of sky battles with the gods was very similar to that Kanye video where it was just uh, very directly and unapologetically uh, conjuring the experience of Renaissance painting uh, with movement and photorealism. And I thought that that movie was, you know, formally interesting for that reason. I don't know if you remember this, but it had all these kind of Caravaggio-like Actually, I have to confess that when Immortals came out, I didn't see it. I don't know. I mean, this is just my opinion. I think that Tarsem is like a more... is 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 like what Zack Snyder would like to be, maybe. Right, sure. Like, but also, you know, I'm not trying to say Immortals is a is a good movie. It's, like, definitely not a good movie in a lot of ways, but it has some interesting parts. I feel like if people want to watch a Tarzan movie, they should watch The Fall, which I think is actually a very, very good movie. And from there, James just started making film recommendations, so all those recommendations are over in the DF4Q episode with James. Again, I gotta urge you to watch The Past Inside the Present at discoverfilm.net. It's just one of those films that's gonna blow you away. 
I just wish it becomes like his eraser head. You know, David Lynch made a eraser head, and the people who saw it ended up making sure he had a career. And I, I really hope the same thing happens for James. Anything you need to know, you can find out at discoverfilm.net. Thanks for listening. Yeah.